This program is brought to you by Emory University. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to CART, uh, CART Vascular Rounds. Uh, grand rounds this morning. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Vaccarino with us, and many of you know her as uh, a professor and chair in the Department of Epidemiology here at the Rollins School of Public Health. Uh, Viola has uh, originally received her medical degree from uh, University of Milan in Italy, her PhD from Yale, and uh, as many of you know, is, is really an internationally recognized expert in interactions between mental stress, depression, et cetera, sort of mind-body interactions in cardiovascular disease. Uh, she's had an, it's an amazing uh, collection of publications throughout the years, uh, many of which have really been landmark articles in the field. Um, one of the really important tools she's used has been this twin study uh, using uh, uh, sets of twins in different uh, locations. And actually, some of my former neighbors are in her study, and they, they say that all the time, so it's not a violation. And uh, they came by and visited the other day after they were in for, in for one of her follow-ups. Uh, uh, but she's done some just amazing work in this field and really been really one of the key features, one of the key players. And we're really pleased to have her with us today and tell us about women's stress and early onset heart disease. Thank you, Bob. That was a very nice introduction. Uh, I'm not going to talk about twins today, actually. I'm going to talk about women. Um, and thank you for being here in such a dark and damp morning. <laughs> Appreciate that. Um, I haven't actually given one of these seminars in a long time. Uh, so I'm very happy to be here and update you on some of the research, research, research we have done in this field and get your thoughts as well. So uh, as a way of a very brief introduction, is uh, you probably know current heart disease uh, in women has traditionally been focused on older women, which is appropriate given that older women carry the, most of the burden of the disease. But uh, we and others uh, re recently have pushed this idea that actually is it's useful and also appropriate to also look at younger women, meaning younger women with heart disease or young women at risk for heart disease. Um, because in some way, this uh, represents almost like an, an extreme phenotype that can give us a lot of useful information in terms of pathophysiology and risk factors and potentially prevention of heart disease in women. And, um, and also, this particular group um, has emerged as a group uh, in many ways vulnerable and in need of special study. Recently, uh, young women have been shown to be lagging in a number of ways. Uh, they show a lower decline in uh, cardiovascular in, uh, uh, heart disease mortality compared to other groups in the US. They show the, an increased incidence of hospitalizations for acute MI, and, um, and they have higher mortality if they develop an MI compared to men of similar age. And this is a finding that we actually reported, probably we are the first ones to report it, but many years ago, almost 20 years ago. And, uh, but, but you know, we were able to bring this up to, to the attention that um, young women, when they develop an MI, uh, they actually have a higher risk, particularly in the younger age groups, uh, and the excess risk decreases with older age. And it's not really due to comorbidities, risk factors, or even severity of, of CAD. If anything, actually, uh, this group shows less indicators of severity. They have better systolic function. They have less current atherosclerosis, et cetera. So um, and, and this is, these are old findings, but they have been um, re replicated many times by many people, including us in several populations. And also, um, and these are data uh, led by Kobe Wilmot when he uh, was here a few years ago as a, as a um, cardiology fellow. The younger uh, people in the US have shown sort of a, um, a stagnation in the decline on <clears throat> heart disease mortality. As you can see, up to 1990, uh, there was a remarkable decline in events, in, in mortality for uh, coronary heart disease in this group, and then it kind of leveled, leveled off, and particularly among women. There's not been much, improved after, uh, much improvement after 1990. And this is not what you see 
when you look at older age groups that have enjoyed remarkable declines uh, throughout the time, even in recent dec decades, both men and women. So uh, as I said, you know, traditional risk factors of disease of severity do not really explain these patterns. So um, an idea that we've been working on is the fact that perhaps the psychosocial sphere may be more important, particularly important in accelerating uh, the risk of heart disease uh, early on in women's lives, so affecting pre primarily uh, younger women and more so than in men. And this is an area where uh, traditionally you know, data are not routinely being collected uh, in, uh, in, clinical, in clinical studies, in large registries. So uh, up to now, we re really did not have a lot of these data uh, r relative uh, to you know, the impact of this, this domain on, on heart disease risk in both women and men. And so our driving concept here uh, has been that the social and emotional exposures that begin early life, including things like early trauma exposures, social disadvantage, which can also lead to depression and PTSD, often starting early in life may be particularly important for women, and uh, for one thing, they are more common among women, uh, particularly younger uh, women. But also, there is some indication that they may, be, uh, they may have a stronger effects in terms of pre predicting heart disease in younger cohorts, particularly in women. And here there are some examples of literature, uh, by no means comprehensive, showing that once you start looking at younger cohorts, then you, you see this pattern coming out that uh, women tend to have more of a, um, uh, 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 their risk seems to be affected more by these factors than men, including early life adversity, social disadvantage, poverty, depression, and there is also data uh, recently emerging for PTSD. So and when we started looking at this, uh, the first thing we noticed was that is, there is a high rate of depression among, among young women with a mind. This, these were, uh, this study was conducted by Susmita Parashar, who is now uh, a cardiolo uh, cardiology faculty here. And uh, uh, <clears throat> so she, she found this excess of uh, depression, specifically in young women, 60 and below. Uh, with, with an acute MI, and instead there was no difference in, pre in the prevalence of depression among older patients with MI. And then we looked at this in other courts. Amit Shah, uh, when he was a cardiology fellow, and now his faculty in epidemiology and here in cardiology, uh, found the same pattern in the Emory Biobank, uh, showing again that if you look at the younger age groups, you see this excess of depression, specifically among young women, uh, which is higher than any of the other groups. Uh, not only depression is higher uh, in women, in young women, but still in the same in the same cohort, he showed that it is associated with a stronger uh, uh, risk of C, uh, subsequent CHD, CHD events and death in young women than in other groups, with the uh, uh, hazard ratio of over two. For, uh, for this group, um, which was highly significant, not uh, as much for the other groups. And then it also has shown a similar pattern even in the community using data from the enhanced tree, which was linked to mortality uh, among people 40 years and younger. He has shown that um, a history of depression or attempted suicide was associated with uh, about 15-fold increased risk of ischemic heart disease mortality among these young women. Um, the risk was increased in men as well, but not to that same extent. And it's not just depression, maybe other factors as well, and these are data from a large uh, study, a community study from Finland showing that childhood adversities are a strong stronger risk factor for early onset CHD among women than uh, men. These were also relatively young people at baseline, less than 55 years old. You can see there was an increased risk for women, not for men. So um, again, our driving concepts here were that, again, social and emotional exposures that begin early life may be especially important for women. 
and they may be implicated particularly in early risk. This was uh, our idea. Um, uh, may uh, impact more uh, CHD risk early in women's life and therefore be particularly risk factors for early onset CHD. And in order to understand this, in general, the, the role of stress and uh, the psychosphere on, on heart disease, particularly among women, we have conducted a number of studies in the uh, recent, recent, recent years. The first one we did was the MIMS one, myocardial infarction and mental stress study. It was a pilot study, small study of uh, less than 100 uh, patients, all post-MI, uh, less than uh, or six, 60 or, and below. Um, who, who all had uh, an MI within the past six months, 50% uh, women. And then we did the, the second phase, MIMS-2, which was a similar design, but much larger, about over 300 patients. And there, we also had controls from the community, about 100 uh, controls. And then together with Arshed and his group, uh, we have conducted for a number of years uh, now, the uh, mental cell ischemia prognosis study through a pro program uh, project grant, uh, which was larger, almost 700 patients uh, with almost 200 women. Of these were of stable CAD as opposed to be post MI. And they had a much broader age range from 34 to 79. And the overall idea and overall uh, goals in terms of our work uh, for women and heart disease was, first of all, to understand the burden or psychosocial factors in young women with MI or stable CAD uh, compared with men of similar age and diagnosis and compared also with community controls. And second, uh, a very important aspect of this research was to uh, use the mental stress testing uh, paradigm. So basically using mental stress in the, in the laboratory to study in a kind of in experimental fashion the acute responses to stress. One factor that we were particularly interested in was myocardial ischemia, uh, and we used SPECT imaging in conjunction with the mental stress to study this. But we also were interested in a number of other factors uh, related to stress response, in particular inflammatory responses to stress and vascular responses to stress. So just in a snapshot, this is what we found, and then I'm going to show you some data, uh, that young women compared with men of the same age, sh first of all, they have a um, higher burden of psychosocial risk factors, but similar risk, traditional risk factors compared with men of the same age. Uh, they have higher rates of myocardial ischemia with mental stress. They have higher inflammatory responses to stress. And microvascular and vasoconstrictive responses to stress are related to mental cell ischemia in women, but not in men. And all these differences become smaller or even absent uh, among older patients. Okay, so these are data from the MIMS2 study, about 300 patients, and also we have controls. When you compare women with MI with men with MI, these are all uh, less, uh, 60 and below, 50% uh, of the sample is female. You don't see a lot of differences between women and men in terms of biomedical traditional risk factors, except perhaps for obesity, they are fairly similar. But when you start looking at social and mental health factors, that's when you start seeing differences between women and men. Women are much more likely to not to be married, to have poor, uh, uh, low income, and to have a history of depression and PTSD. But in order to um, understand the burden of these factors, it's also useful not only to compare women to men, but also to compare patients to community controls, to kind of have an idea of what the actual burden is compared to, to healthy people. And when we do this, uh, for example, these are data for women, comparing women with MI to their uh, respective community controls of the same age. Here, for example, you find that women with MI have uh, about 137% more depressive symptoms compared to women without MI. They have 116 times more depression than women without MI, and so on. Um, so when, when you uh, look at men, men also show an excess of these factors compared to their community controls. 
but the impact seems to be less than in women. And uh, again, you know, the uh, burden, the, the largest difference in terms of burden of uh, stressors compared to, to, to healthy people is mostly in uh, the domain of depression, stress, PTSD, early child uh, uh, adversities. Things like anxiety or uh, anger don't really show up to be tremendously different. Okay, so as I said before, uh, a major part of our work was to study mental stress-induced ischemia, which um, is an interesting phenomenon, uh, particularly for us interested in stress because it's being considered sort of like a marker of cardiovascular vulnerability to stress. But it's also prognostic on its own right. And um, most clinicians may not be terribly familiar with this, um, but it's basically, it's the same, it's a similar phenomenon as an exercise stress induced ischemia, for example, but it's induced by mental stress rather than exercise or pharmacological stress. It's common in patients with CHD, uh, up to 50%, depending on the sample and the way it's detected. It's, it's thought to be clinically silent in most cases, and uh, it's been shown to correlate with ischemia in everyday life, although there is not a lot of data on that. And it is associated with worse prognosis, about twofold, and I'm going to show you more about that. But it seems to be clinically distinct from exercise-induced ischemia because it can occur also in absence of normal, uh, when there is a normal exercise stress test. And uh, several studies have shown that it does not correlate with severity of CAD, although they are not totally consistent. But it seems to be more associated with microvascular function. And these are data uh, from uh, uh, meta-analysis we did actually a few years ago and uh, was uh, led by Jin Kai Wei, who at that time was a master's student in our program. We looked for uh, prognostic studies uh, of mental stress ischemia. We only found five uh, relatively small studies with a, a pooled sample of about uh, a little bit over 500 patients. Um, the uh, pooled risk was 2, 2.2, so basically twofold increased risk uh, associated with mental stress induced ischemia for, for uh, uh, mortality and recurrent CHD events. So it was relatively consistent across studies, as you can see here. But um, interestingly, the, uh, this, the sample was 85% male. So up to now, really, we did not know much about mental health induced ischemia among women. And so briefly, this is our mental health protocol. Um, we uh, start with a short period of, 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 of rest. Then the patients are given instructions uh, to prepare a speech that we, we give them a scenario, kind of sort of with an emotional component. Uh, they are given two minutes to prepare the speech and then three minutes to deliver it in front of a small audience wearing uh, white coats, people they have not met before, people who, who do not have, kind of, with sort of an intimida intimidating um, uh, outlook. And, um, and then after that, there is the recovery period. And throughout uh, the mental stress, we, of course, monitor heart rate, blood pressure. And the radioisotope is being injected at peak stress at one minute into the uh, speech for the myocardial perfusion imaging, which uh, we do with SPECT, as I said, uh, using the 17 second segment model. And as you can see here, uh, this is an example of a patient who developed a perfusion defect with mental stress, <clears throat> but not with the exercise stress. And the beauty of uh, using SPECT for this is that you, you are able to inject the radioisotope at the time of peak stre stress, and therefore you get a snapshot of what happens then, even though the patient is imaged later. Okay, so these are the results related to sex differences in the mental stress ischemia. From the first study we did, the pilot, you know, 98 patients, um, small study. But nonetheless, we showed that there is this excess of ischemia with mental stress, specifically among women 50 and below, about twice the rate of mental stress ischemia. Uh, instead, there was no difference among older patients.
But again, you know, very small s sample, so people, many people did not really believe it. Uh, so we really had to re replicate it. And we did replicate it in the MIMS too, actually. And the paper actually is in press right now. It should come out next week. And what we found is, um, again, there is about twofold uh, incidence of ischemic mental stress among women. And these are, again, all uh, patients 60 and below. So relatively young uh, post-MI patients with their event within the last eight months. So a very defined uh, uh, patient group. The uh, results, again, were not explained by traditional risk factors or CAD severity or psycho even psychosocial risk factors, even adjusting for depression did not really change the, result the results much. And then the next question was, but is this really something specifically for young women? Or why is that? It may be something more in general that affects women in general uh, that have a higher likelihood of ischemia with mental stress. So we, we looked at this in the MIP study, which is a larger group and has a, a age range that's much broader from 34 to 80, basically. And so here, here we were able to look at whether there is a difference by age. And again, we showed this um, this excess of ischemia among young women, particularly 50 and below, but the risk starts increasing sort of after six, uh, you know, 60 and below. Uh, here, the results are expressed as, as percent or less ventricle uh, with ischemia. So ischemia is, is modeled as a continuous variable. And again, um, results remain similar after adjusting for a number of other factors. So there is this uh, uh, excess of ischemia with mental stress among women, particularly young women. The next question then is what are the mechanisms uh, for this kind of proclivity towards ischemia with mental stress among young women with heart disease? And in order to understand this, it may be useful to kind of review quickly the physiology of mental stress ischemia a little bit. Uh, so with mental stress, of course, uh, there is an increase in sympathetic activation, which uh, causes uh, an increase in heart rate and blood pressure, uh, and therefore increase in cardiac output and myocardial oxygen demand, which in turn, uh, in turn uh, can increase, uh, can cause a situation of perfusion demand uh, supply mismatch and therefore <clears throat> be the basis of ischemia. At the same time, also sympathetic activation uh, can cause vasoconstriction. It could be at the level of coronary arteries, could be systemic, uh, and can cause uh, systemic vascular resistance and potentially increase in cardiac afterload, which also can contribute to ischemia. Also, uh, the uh, sympathetic nervous system is known, is known to uh, uh, basic, basically cause an inflammatory response. So there is a surge in inflammatory cytokines, which also can contribute to the vascular changes that we can see with mental stress. And this is exactly what we found actually in the MIP study. These are data, uh, it was work done by our cardiology fellows involved in the MIP study, working with us in our shed. Uh, lots of work uh, done uh, with this large study, uh, starting with Roni Ramadan and then Mohammed Hamada. They have published uh, considerably on this data. And basically, that's what uh, we found that uh, hemodynamic response and as well as peripheral vasoconstrictions are predictors of mental stress-induced ischemia. So those who develop mental stress ischemia have higher systolic blood pressure, higher diastolic blood pressure, higher heart rate, and they have a higher uh, rate pressure product. They also tend to vasoconstrict more during mental stress. And the way we measure vasoconstriction is at the periphery uh, using this particular device called the PAT ratio, uh, peripheral arterial tonometry, sorry, peripheral arterial tonometry, which gives you a ratio, a ratio of pulse to weight amplitude during mental stress over the pulse to weight amplitude during resting period based on the finger. So it's basically based on a platysmo, uh, platysmography type of um, uh, phenomenon, the device. And a PAT ratio less than one is an indication of vasoconstriction. As you can see here, 
the, uh, those who developed ischemia had more vasoconstriction or a lower PAT ratio. But so uh, in, interestingly, um, there were no differences between patients who were MSI positive or negative in terms of endothelial function using a uh, measure with FMD, flow mediated vasodilation, or arterial stiffness using with uh, pulse wave velocity, which we measured before stress and 30 minutes after stress. So um, the uh, vascular function uh, pathway is likely to be implicated in the sex differences in ischemia that we see. And this is because uh, we, we know that women may have a propensity towards a vascular dysfunction. They are more likely to have abnormal coronary activity than men. And also they are thought to be more vulnerable to microvascular disease, and which could be a reason why they tend to have ischemic heart disease with less coronary stenosis compared with men. So uh, if women, um, if microvascular vasomotion is more common in women, then uh, they may be more likely to have stress-induced vasomotion, which then could be the substrate for mental stress ischemia. And when we looked at this, and this work has been done by Sema Sullivan, who is a postdoc in our program, and the paper has been recently published. When we looked at the PAT responses, by gender, what she found was that women who develop mental stress ischemia have a much lower PAT ratio than those who do not develop mental stress ischemia, but there is no difference among men. So overall, actually, women have a higher PAT ratio in general. They vasoconstricted less than men during stress, but if, they, if those who vasoconstricted had a much li a higher likelihood to develop ischemia. So a vasoconstriction for women is much more strongly related to ischemia than in men. And we replicated the same findings in a completely separate sample, the MIMS-2. Uh, these are all post-MI patients. Again, vasoconstriction was related to is mental stress-induced ischemia among women and not among men. So peripheral vasoconstriction uh, is a determinant of MSI MI in women. Uh, could be an effect of peripheral increase, increase in peripheral uh, um, resistance, you know, uh, potentially leading to increased afterload for the heart, but could also be a marker of what happens at the, uh, at the coronary level that perhaps they would be vasoconstricting at the coronary level as well as uh, in the periphery. We, we don't know that because we were not able to measure what happens in the coronaries at the same time. But um, this is also supported by parallel fi findings of the relationship between uh, metastasis ischemia and uh, angiograph CD severity. Um, and this work was done by Zakaria al who is uh, in the uh, Department of uh, Hospital Medicine here at Emory. When we looked at this by sex, separately men and women, uh, we found that um, for mental stress, those who are positive for ischemia, the men, they show a relationship with severity of coronary angiography. But among women, you do not see any relationship between uh, uh, ischemia being ischemic for, with mental stress and severity uh, of uh, coronary, uh, of, uh, at the angiographic findings, basically burden of coronary artery disease. Again, suggesting that perhaps for women it's more like a microvascular phenomenon rather than a, a traditional supply mismatch type of phenomenon. And when we look at conventional stress, we find the uh, expected relationship of ischemia with the severity of coronary uh, angiography findings uh, in both women and men. So it seems to be something specific for ischemia with mental stress. So another potential factor that is involved here is uh, the neuroendocrine and immune function uh, uh, sphere. And potentially, there may be sex differences in immune regulation to stress reactivity, which 
it suggests that by a number of findings in the literature, that women tend to have higher baseline inflammation, particularly in the uh, premenopausal years. And um, also women have been shown, there's not a lot of data, but some data suggesting that they may have a decreased peripheral glucocorticoid sen sensitivity with stress, which then leads to an increased or prolonged cytokine response with stress. So we looked at, that, at this initially in the small pilot uh, MIMS-1 study, and Sherry Rooks, at that time she was a postdoc with us, did this work. And what we found was this remarkable difference in levels of IL-6 between post-MI women and men post-MI in this small sample, um, if they were 50 and below, which was present at baseline and remained throughout the mental stress, while there was no difference in the older patients between women and men. So, uh, and then Sama looked at this in the larger MIPS study. Actually, this was a the MIPS and MIMS2 combined because the results were pretty similar in the two samples. So we just combined them with, uh, with then a total sample of over 800 patients with broad age range. And because the sample was large enough and uh, the spread of age allowed it, she was able to model age as a continuous variable and then she de derived uh, estimates by age and what you see here is that there is a remarkable uh, difference in results depending by age. In, in the younger age groups, women have a, a higher level, baseline, baseline level of IL-6, but also a more dramatic response increased in IL-6 with stress compared with men. And the differences go down as age becomes older. And the overall stress response, uh, inflammatory response to stress also becomes blunted at older ages. But it's mostly in these in this younger age groups that you see this large difference. <coughs> so another, yet another possibility is electrophysiology. And this work has mostly been uh, led by Wesley Wes O'Neill, who is a cardiology fellow here in the program. And he has found that um, mental stress can result in abnormal left atrial electrophysiology. 23% of patients develop actually a new P way terminal force in lead V1, and 13 develop an abnormal P wave axis. And what is interesting also is that uh, women show more PTFV1 abnormality with mental stress. And those who develop mental stress ischemia have about fivefold the odds of developing an abnormal P wave axis with stress. So there seem to be some difference there, maybe interesting to explore more, perhaps uh, differences in autonomic response to stress between women and men who can, that can also be uh, part of, of these um, differences that we see in, uh, um, in ischemia. And finally, it is possible that what we see in the lab is a reflection of what happens in everyday life due to exposure to stressors, depressions, other, uh, depression, other factors in everyday life, and perhaps repeated ischemic uh, episodes during everyday life. We don't know yet for sure, but this is suggested by the fact that we find that angina in the past month is related to mental stress ischemia in women, but not in men. As you can see here, those women who uh, uh, reported angina in the past month had about twice as much ischemic myocardium than those uh, who do not, did not report angina, and there was no difference in men. So uh, it, it's clear that angina is related to mental stress ischemia in women, but not in men, and actually 60% of these women, of the women with ischemia with mental stress reported angina in the past month. But it's also interesting to note that um, there is no relationship between angina uh, in the past month and conventional stress ischemia in either women or men. 
So that was kind of surpri surprising finding, suggesting that the engine, I, for the most part, at least the way it is being measured here, is more like uh, perhaps a psychosocial type of phenomenon more than an actual you know, ischemic event, perhaps. We don't know. It definitely is an area that needs more investigation. So in conclusion, um, young women with heart disease um, show a disproportionate psychosocial burden compared with men. Uh, with, uh, compared with men uh, with the same condition as well as with con community controls. Mm -hmm. And they have higher rate of myocardial ischemia with the psychological stress. So what does this all mean? Well, it could mean that stress, mood, or ischemia, ischemia in everyday life could be triggers of acute chronic syndromes in women more than in men, and this is why we find them more in this group. It could also be that uh, women, particularly the younger women, may have a greater emotional response to the cardiac event itself, and that's why we find this. Could also be just related to sex difference in stress physiology, as we we are starting to see. But in general, um, our data is support the notion that stress can set a trajectory increased risk for women starting a younger age, uh, which may result in in early onset of CHD in women and potentially also affect the prognosis of this this group, um, increased mortality after they develop an event. And I just wanted to conclude uh, saying that, um, unfortunately, all this work right now is very far away from being part of any implementation in terms of prevention or, or um, you know, policy. If you look at current uh, prevention guidelines or campaigns for risk reduction, such as the uh, Go Red for Women campaign from the American Heart Association, there is nothing about stress, stress reduction, or mental health nothing. It's all about numbers, it's all about uh, traditional risk factors, which is good, it's great, you know, to increase awareness on all this, but it's a little, little bit disheartening that there is nothing about the psychosocial sphere, even though we are accumulating all these data suggesting that it's so important. And the EHA has done multiple press releases for this work, and NHLBI has had our work in their website, I mean, I think we start becoming more aware of this, but still we are far away from implementing any of this. And a part of this, I think, is because we rely so much on results of, from clinical trials, and it's particularly for, for the drafting of guidelines. And right now, there is very little in terms of uh, you know, data uh, from, from uh, clinical trials. Part of that is that it's very difficult to conduct behavior interventions, successful behavior interventions. And so there, you know, this fair is really a disadvantage compared to other areas like starting trials or other things when you give a pill and then you look at the results. So there is this problem here, and uh, I just wanted to point out that much more work needs to be done in order to translate this in, in actual prevention uh, for, for everyone. And I want to conclude, again, acknowledging all the people that have worked so hard on these projects. And these are, of course, all the young people who have helped with this research. But by, by no means, these are not the only one, because we have many more who have helped so much behind the scenes and uh, every day uh, helping uh, carry out these very complex uh, research studies. And of course, all our collaborators, particularly Arshed, from, from cardiology, others uh, from radiology, psychiatry, uh, and as well as epidemiology. Thank you very much. That was fantastic. I'll, I'll start you off with the first question, mm -hmm. which is a little outside the box. Um, what about the role of the sort of gut microbiome in all of this? I, you know, when I think about this thing, I, this, uh, the story you laid out, I think about three pieces of data. One is, is that there's growing collection of data showing impact of changes in the gut microbiome and, and gut in a permeability on cardiovascular disease. 
there's a long history, apparently, which was sort of news to me until a year or so ago, about um, a variety of psychiatric illnesses and depression on gut microbiome. And then there's more recent data showing sympathetic outflow changing gut permeability. So do you think that plays into any of this? And, you know, it, or is that just sort of another sort of epiphenomenon? It's a great question. I agree there is you know, very compelling data coming out potentially. Uh, it makes sense physiologically. I don't think we have a lot of data yet. Interestingly, we had a pilot study designed to do this. And um, I, I don't, I'm not going to go into details of what happened, but basically um, our samples were mismanaged and we lost the data. So uh, we were not able to, to, to see what happened. We are, I have a little bit of leftovers that we are going to look. We had samples from the saliva, for just saliva microbiome co uh, collected pre and post stress and nicely matched patients and controls and men and women to see differences. So mostly, I think we lost the opportunity, but we'll still see if we can make sense of what we have left. Because that was an idea that we wanted to work on. Uh, whether actually uh, the microbiome and changes with stress and differences between people who have certain responses versus not may uh, provide new avenues uh, in un for understanding some of these factors in physiology. Other questions? Thank you, Viola. Uh, wonderful presentation. Um, so a lot of this data is cross-sectional in nature in terms of the relationship of age and what happens to women. So what, what do you, how do you explain that? How do women become looking like men when they get older? What happens to these women, do you think, as they get older? Or are they submerged within that older crowd? Or does the reactivity change with age? And are there any control populations that we've tested reactivity on? Well, it's, it's hard to tell because, again, uh, it seems like the women who develop heart disease early on have this kind of higher risk in terms of being more likely to die sooner. Um, and we actually conducted studies, so up to two years, you still see this excess mortality for young women with, uh, with an MI, although they don't have the traditional risk factors, at least not in a more pronounced way. So then you are left with uh, the older uh, population, which in some ways is a little bit different, right? Because all the high risk ones, the ones you are interested in, have been removed, have died, or you know they, they are not there anymore. So your older women look more like men, look you know not at higher risk. In, in, in many, in some of the studies we have done, actually, older women with heart disease with NMI or unstable angina, they actually have better survival. They, they do better. So you don't know if that's age or it's just a bias due to the fact that all the risk, uh, risk ones have been removed from your population. Uh, so it's, it's uh, at this moment, we don't know yet. Um, we may be able to answer some of these questions uh, in a small fashion with our data, perhaps and if we are able to continue getting uh, funding to follow up these samples for a longer time and see um, some preliminary data that is very preliminary, so I didn't show, is that, for example, women who, um, who die of the follow-up in the MIPS tend to have a much deeper, um, much worse endothelial function with, with, with stress. They actually have worsening of endothelial function during stress is much more marked than uh, those who do not develop events and also of men. So you don't see that in men, you only see that in women. Again, suggesting that the vasculature in some way is related to the outcomes of these women, uh, particularly, we think, particularly the younger women who do not have a huge burden of coronary atherosclerosis. Hi, thank you. Um, so my question was in the younger women who vasoconstricted, did you happen to look at their estradiol, or FSH, or LH levels to see if there's problems with, uh, you know, because estrogen will affect vascular function? Yeah, so that's obviously something that 
comes up to mind, you know, maybe this is all due to being premenopausal, being uh, you know, uh, estrogen uh, you know, hormone related. Um, we, we did not have estrogen measurements, and so we could not account for that directly. We did account for it, whether they self-reported that they were premenopausal or not, and that did not affect at all the results. So uh, most, of those, uh, most of those 50 and below were premenopausal, though not 100%. So there was still a way to adjust for that, and that did not really explain. Uh, now we, we have data on, uh, on anti-mullerian hormone, and we are going to do the analysis now to see whether that can help. Anti-mullerian hormone is uh, an hormone that is sort of like a, a marker of ovarian reserve, so it can kind of go uh, in that direction, trying to explain whether hormonal factors, ovarian function may have a role here. This is uh, very interesting. I, I have two questions. One, uh, do you know regarding your uh, circulation paper, the etiology of the myocardial infarctions that the people had, uh, the young women, which uh, smoking is a is a huge risk factor in young women, mm -hmm. and uh, but since they had infarction, many of them had angiograms, might have known something about whether they had large vessel disease. So that's one question, and, and the other is since your uh, measure of ischemia is actually not a measure of ischemia, but measure uh, spec is a measure of differential flow. And the example you showed is a quite regional, but we're talking about microvascular dysfunction. So how do you reconcile the, and how much of the observed uh, uh, positive spec scans were, were regional like this? And how does that, how do you explain that? We uh, define ischemia in most of these data that I showed you uh, is sort of regionally, you know, we're looking at different uh, segments and then having a specific criterion for ischemia within segment. And so that's the way. It was not just, you know, uh, a global score. So I think that in some way should take that into account, but I agree with you that uh, it could be just uh, a relative difference in flow rather than I was wondering if there's any possibility of d re replicating these kind of experiments with CT angiograms or something to see actually whether there's coronary changes in coronary caliber. Do you mind? Um, so there, there was a sub-study of MIPS where we did this in the cath lab, me and Creton and others. Um, and uh, we could look at the coronary diameter and measure coronary blood flow with a flow wire as people were undergoing this kind of a stress. And you can see epicardial vessels constricting a little bit, not too much. And of course, the coronary blood flow would go down. And then we tried to correlate it with the endothelial function measurements, and there seems to be some contribution. So in other words, uh, people who had worse function in the microcirculation had greater constriction. Um, so I, I think the way to explain that defect which you would, you would ideally want it to be kind of diffuse and everywhere and therefore not measurable by spec, or just have an inner ring um, uh, sort of widening of the uh, cavity because you have microvascular ischemia all around. The reason I think is that you could have a 50% lesion, which you, we would consider not significant, but then you have this intense vasoconstriction and that segment that myocardial segment is more likely to become ischemic than where there's a 20% lesion, for example. So uh, the coronary angiogram is interpreted as no significant disease, but there is a lot of disease here and there. And that might make it the defect more regional as opposed to more diffuse as you would expect. So I, I mean, uh, my, you know, and we all, this is all about interpretation, but my interpretation is that this vasoconstriction that we see in the digital circulation by using this PAT device is what's happening in the coronary circulation, both in the epicardium as well as in the microcirculation. It's not like it's happening in one place and not in the other place. But it depends on the rigidity of your epicardial arteries, how calcified and solid they are as to how much happens in the epicardial vessel and how much happens in the microcirculation. But overall, coronary blood flow in an extremely normal person, young person, should go up during mental stress. It actually goes down once you have endothelial dysfunction and you have coronary artery disease. 
So you switch from vasodilation to vasoconstriction by the mere fact that you have disease in the circulation. And the extent to which you react leads to ischemia or no ischemia. But I think overall, this whole thing is probably determined by our reactivity. It just so happens that you develop a mismatch on, on SPECT. But um, you know, the fact that you have this huge inflammatory response and you constrict this way, whereas the other person doesn't during mental stress, I think dictates how your disease progresses and how likely you are to have a bad outcome over time. I think that's what we're looking at. Rather than saying you have ischemia, you don't have ischemia. It's a very binary way of looking. But I think it's much more of a spectrum. Can you quantify the stress, dose of stress? So we have tried uh, using obviously blood pressure responses. You can do that. Um, you can, and, and we see a relationship between blood pressure responses and ischemia, in fact. Um, we have tried using catecholamine data, and uh, um, we haven't really seen any particular relationship. And also self-reporting, we asked the patients how much they were stressed during, during the speech. That doesn't predict anything. Um, so it's a quantification of the actual stress. It's very difficult. And overall, the physiological response is a better predictor of what they actually tell. So uh, great talk, Fiola, and uh, really great effort sort of from the whole group in this field. The way I think about it is there's sort of three, three different questions. What well, One is understanding the mechanisms of this association that you guys have discovered. And, and I think some of the work uh, on the gene bank front can also help inform you know, which of these various axes uh, might be relevant whether it's inflammatory axes or the microbiome, or it sounds like there's a lot more mechanistic understanding that needs to happen. But I think in the meanwhile, uh, you know, Pooja and I and, and Gina and others see a lot of patients, uh, women with chest pain, uh, that are very difficult to tease out. So I think beyond the mechanistic issue is kind of the current clinical issue of how to deal with these patients. And, and I think there, um, to your point, we, we really do need to come up with some, you know, general consensus and standardized protocols of testing that make sense, and then implicate implementation of existing medical therapies. I think the one advantage of patients coming to the cath lab is that, you know, you can potentially tease out whether it's endothelial function, microvascular, or as Arshad says, there may be some mixed epicardial disease. And you could potentially tease out the contribution of all that. But then ultimately, you know, how do you treat these patients? And how do you set up these protocols, whether it's psychological interventions or, you know, lifestyle modifications or dietary uh, or pharmacologic? I mean, it seems like we really should be the place to at least have a combined effort in, in that regard. Um, it sounds like we have all the substrate to to kind of lead this from a mechanistic to a current standard of care and to ultimately affect the guidelines. Yes, I agree with you. And I think the population you see is a little bit more extreme because these may be the women with recurrent chest pain and can be particularly difficult to manage. Uh, we have focused on just post MI or women, you know, most of them asymptomatic by the time that they come to us. And we still see all this. Uh, so in, in most cases, you know, when we discover ischemia in the lab, they didn't have any chest pain. So it's, uh, it's probably very much a continuum, a spectrum. Um, but um, these patients, early onset MI patients, both men and women, but particularly women, they are very sick. It's a population that's it's amazing. There is a very high uh, proportion of minorities, particularly among women. 70% of post MI young women are African American with all sort of baggage in terms of, um, you know, social factors that they carry with them. So uh, it's uh, it's a very interesting population that we don't often think about all these things in our patients. Uh, 
Well, with that, thanks so much for a fantastic talk, and thanks for all the mentoring of our trainees. We appreciate it. Thanks. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.